Welcome to the channel, everyone. This week I'm doing a, a fun little special edition podcast style episode on uh, the new movie Soul from Disney Plus. I wanted to do uh, my my own kind of little movie review on this film because I watched it on uh, New Year's Eve night, actually. And, uh, you know, I heard a lot of people talking about it and I was absolutely blown away by this movie. It instantly became my favorite movie I've ever watched, probably. And I was just really impressed by uh, how much they got right in this movie. I sort of started to wonder, like, man, who wrote this movie? Because this is some pretty next level understanding of reincarnation and the nature of the soul and all of that. And so I knew right away I got to do a I got to do a video on this. So. You know, I teach Law of One, and Law of One talks a lot about reincarnation, so I'm going to be tying in some a lot of themes from what the Law of One teaches, especially to how uh, the movie Soul portrays the process of reincarnation. And I was also impressed at the way that it, um, and, and I'm sure this was a resource that the writers used, but I was impressed by the way it tied into near-death experiences. If you've ever read um, NDEs, you'll know that they certainly pulled a lot of their themes for the experience people describe having when they have an NDE was very well portrayed in this movie. And it was just incredibly beautiful all throughout. In the beginning of the movie, when they started laying out the, the main characters and the plot and all of that, I started to get a feel of like, oh man, I think I know where they're going to go with this storyline. And if they do, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> and to my surprise, that's exactly where they took it. And it was done in such an artistic way that wasn't cheesy, that really delivered the message and the meaning in a way that I think impacts people beyond just the conceptual mind. Like even if people maybe couldn't put into words what I'm going to explain in this video, the heart understands the message and it just speaks to so much truth that um, you know, everyone I've talked to who's watched it, all my friends said they they totally lost it too, and uh, you know I I love those moments when a movie, really any art, I'm I'm such a huge fan of art because I think art is real true worship of the divine, in the sense that real art captures the movement of the divine, that unfolding mystery in a way that nothing else quite can, and just the beauty of creation and life in a way that words can never capture. And when movies do it really well, it has a, uh, an impact on me that always will make me, just overwhelm me with, with so much meaning and truth and beauty that I'll just cry and weep. And it's totally spontaneous when it happens. And so you just gotta appreciate it when it does. And I haven't cried from watching a movie in many years. And so I had a, a really beautiful moment to this movie. So obviously, Spoiler alert, I'm going to be talking in great detail about the plot of the movie and all of that. So if you have not seen it yet, you might not want to watch this uh, podcast, but definitely watch this after you see the movie because I think that there's a lot of golden nuggets in this movie that most people probably don't catch. And there's so many actually, I couldn't even talk about all of them. I had to kind of pick and choose my favorites, but I went back and rewatched it the second time to make notes of all the things that really jumped out to me. So uh, we'll go ahead and get into it. So the movie begins where Joe Gardner, you know, he plays his, uh, his jazz performance for the, um, I can't remember the character's name, the saxophone player. She's impressed, she gives him the gig. He's, you know, skipping down the street, all happy. This is his big meaning, his big purpose in life is to have a, a performance like this where he can show what he's worth as a musician. And then, of course, he falls down the drain and dies, and his soul plops into um, you know the astral plane, and he's going towards this great light that everyone who has an NDE describes going towards this light of um, people typically describe it as pure, unconditional love beyond description that just kind of melts you away. But Joe runs the other way, right? He doesn't want to die yet because he has a karmic attachment. He has an attachment to his former incarnation that, um, as you know, in the Hindu tradition or the Buddhist tradition, they talk about the cycle of death and rebirth, um, being a, a working of karma, 
when the, when a soul has an attachment to the material world, it has to reincarnate to fulfill that unmet desire or whatever it is. So Joe needs to go back. He's trying to get back to his body. He goes back to, um, you know, the realm of the, the higher self and the creation of where souls come from. And this is where things got really amazing to me. Um, you know, there's that, that initial line where one of the, I don't know, archangels, higher selves, they're all named Jerry, which I think is, uh, is very interesting. I think that they are pointing to this idea that higher states of consciousness don't have individual separate identity any longer. It's, it's a very much a oneness identity. So all of the angels or higher selves in this realm are all named Jerry, which I thought was a cute way of depicting it. <laughs> and uh, all the little baby souls come out. And I thought that this was cool how they, they were all like little happy Buddhas, like little Buddha children who were just totally innocent. And I think that that captures the, the nature of our souls in such a great way that we are all just the same exact fragments of the source's consciousness or the source's beingness that it, it projects out into space and time and each individual soul begins sort of like Play-Doh or something. We all come from the same pile of Play-Doh, if that could be what we would depict as the source. And each little piece of Play-Doh gets taken out, all identical in the beginning, but through the process of incarnation, those souls get molded into new characters and figures. And you notice this in the beginning where the baby souls are all identical. They look exactly the same. And as they go through um, the process of incarnating and having their personalities molded, they take on actual character shapes. So older souls in the movie have actual faces and different um, body types and personalities and things like that. So it really speaks to that oneness that we all come from the same source and really at our core are all that same innocent, pure source consciousness. And the next thing that was cool was that um, I just literally made a post about this a few weeks ago. The, uh, the higher self lady person thing, Jerry, <laughs> says... I am the coming together of all quantized fields in the universe um, in a form that your feeble mind can understand. <laughs> and I thought that was cool because like that's very much how higher density beings would conceptualize themselves. They have a, a cosmic consciousness, right? They know themselves as the whole universe manifesting as a certain form or figure or character. And so the quantized field being says... Uh, this is not the great beyond. This is the great before. I just went, wow, like this is incredible. I can't believe this is a major Hollywood film. Um, I just made a post last week or the week before, um, which said, you are beyond everything. And I was explaining this idea of what does it mean in spirituality when we say you are beyond everything? We conceptualize that to mean you have transcended everything. Like you've gone through the experience and you've beaten it and you've, you've conquered it and you're beyond it now. The linear mind can only think that way. But what be, being beyond everything actually means is being before everything. The egoic mind, when it hears you are beyond that thing you're suffering from, it says, no, I'm not. I can't possibly be beyond it. I'm suffering from it. Like I haven't... I haven't transcended it yet. And being beyond it actually means you're before that. You are earlier than that. Your original nature, your essence came before that thought, that story, that trauma, that memory, that catalyst. You are earlier than that thing in the place of pure consciousness. So it's like know yourself as that, be that, abide as that, and you will recognize that whatever life throws at me, I'm earlier than it. I'm the witness of it. So it was pretty cool that she says, this is the great before, meaning this is where we come from before even the idea of the world was ever born. I am, right? Uh, the next thing that was cool to me was that they show the little baby souls in that little um, movie theater area where they're explaining how reincarnation works. They show all the little souls having um, like a little emblem with different archetypes on it that 
shape their personality. And um, this was a cool idea in terms of like the zodiac or the archetypal mind. The law of one talks about this a lot. And the little baby souls go through these um, sort of like these little machines, right? Where they go into, um, I think the higher self, Jerry commands them to go into the, uh, the excitable machine. All the souls run in, the, the little flowery thing goes up and down. They come out and they're all excited. Like they've gained that archetype. And the law of one talks about the archetypal mind, which is set up by the logos. The logos is essentially the star of the star system. Every star in the universe creates the archetypal mind that every soul incarnating on planets within that solar system will sort of be pressed through the filter of that archetypal system. And the movie kind of depicts that away with that emblem that shows the different archetypes that they're collecting. Our souls, as we go through hundreds or unknown amount of lifetimes of human incarnations, we have to experience every sign in the zodiac um, from Aries through Pisces. We have to exchange these energies, move through them, embody them, experience them, because that's how the soul evolves and it, it increases its vibration. And the tarot deck talks about the archetypal mind and the, the 22 arcana, major arcana. That's another way of seeing um, those little figures on their emblems. Basically, what we call our personality is a configuration of these archetypal energies. And although the movie showed the souls going through those little machines that mold their personalities, what actually happens, of course, is it is the incarnations that mold the personality. The human lifetimes we live shape us and mold us and configure us based on the experiences we have and the way we respond to those experiences. And when you saw the part where all the baby souls are jumping through that, that little void where they are going to incarnate on planet Earth, the cool uh, parallel there is in the Law of One, they talk about the idea that the higher self, when the soul is still in its sort of infancy, um, which in, in the law of one is first and second density, before the soul has really learned self-awareness, uh, the higher self chooses the incarnations for that soul and just basically just keeps plugging it back into our incarnations of plant, animal, whatever, until it reaches the stage where the, the soul, uh, the consciousness of the soul has evolved enough to be able to handle a human lifetime and all of the variables that come with it. If the soul hasn't first been a rock or water or an insect or a plant or an animal and hasn't mastered that realm of beingness yet, it, there's no way it could handle being a human being yet. So the, the souls, after they've gathered enough of their little emblems, they're able to incarnate on earth. The next part I thought was cool was when uh, 22 and Joe are going through all the different like potential experiences a human lifetime can have and sort of test running them out. And there's that scene where she slaps Joe a bunch and he like doesn't feel pain and she feeds him pizza. And he can't taste it. And he's sort of like has that aha moment where he's like, hey, I can't taste anything. I can't feel anything. I can't experience anything. And she's like, yeah, you can't experience anything without a body. And that's very much from what people who have NDEs say, there's the understanding that like, oh wow, um, to have these sensory experiences that teach us so much about who we are and what we are, you have to incarnate into a lifetime. In this realm, there, there is no otherness to experience something through. And then she takes Joe to the zone where you see all the souls floating around, uh, dreaming of doing different activities. And she says, this is the connection point between the physical and the spiritual. And I thought that was really cool the way they depicted that because in the, uh, in the Hindu tradition, the, it's said that the nature of being is Sat Chit Ananda, which means existence, consciousness, bliss. And it essentially is pointing to this idea that the awareness of being itself is bliss. And we experience this in the flow state which is really where the idea or belief in being a person dissolves away. There's no awareness or, or thought of I'm a body doing an action, but you just merge with the very activity you're doing. 
So they show souls floating, you know, playing the saxophone, the piano, skiing down a mountain, reading a book. And it's showing these souls that have disconnected from body consciousness and have merged with the being, the activity, the doing of whatever it is they're doing. And they're all in bliss. They're all like floating up there blissed out. And uh, when she throws the little snowballs at them, and like the actress, she's in a flow state acting, and then she um, throws the snowball at her, takes her out of the out of the zone, and she forgets her line. You know, the basketball player misses the slam dunk, and it's kind of pointing to this idea that as soon as the working mind comes back in, we leave the flow state. As soon as like Michael Jordan would say, when I was in the zone, I couldn't miss a shot, because the zone is the place of no mind. So Jordan can't be thinking thoughts like, oh, I got to make this three-pointer or I'm going to ruin the game. The whole game is resting on this shot. If he thinks that, he's definitely going to miss the shot. He has to be absent, right? He has to be so merged with the action of playing basketball that there's no longer a person playing basketball. He just, he becomes basketball, right? That's the flow state. So that was cool the way they showed that. And then she shows Joe the lost souls. And they're these souls that have become these big dark figurines that are wandering aimlessly through the darkness. And they're just repeating some phrase to themselves. And this was really cool because it shows, it's showing the idea of a soul that gets lost in an attachment. When a soul gets extremely attached or identified with something, they become a lost soul. They've basically become lost in a dream within a dream. They've kind of created a story of their life during their life. And that story becomes a kind of dream life that they're living in their mind, ignorant to reality. And so that soul was saying, you know, make a trade, make a trade, make a trade. And when that shadowy figure that was covering it dissolves, it shows it was always a pure, innocent soul that was lost in this, in this nightmare. And I love that because Law of One talks about this. A Course in Miracles, the whole book is about this idea that by, only by seeing the light within someone who's lost can you wake them up out of the nightmare they're stuck in. When someone's being evil or, or attacking someone or creating suffering for others, they're lost in a nightmare. And only love can heal them and re- remind them, wake them up to who they really are. I think the character actually says something like, what have I been doing with my life? And he has this sort of realization that he's been working for things that don't last and are impermanent and don't ultimately matter. And so I thought that was really cool because it shows how even even being lost in the dream, the nightmare of separation, you know, he was lost in this karmic attachment to making money on the stock market. All the suffering he experienced during that nightmare eventually had a silver lining, right? It showed him that you don't need to look for yourself in the world. You can't be satisfied with money or things or outcomes. The world can't fulfill you. Only by experiencing that karmic attachment and working through it could he learn that lesson. Words don't teach, life teaches, right? So it was really cool the way they showed a character having that epiphany by going through that experience. So now we kind of get into the meat and bones of the movie where uh, Joe and 22 are able to incarnate back into Joe's body, but 22 is in Joe's body and Joe's in a cat's body. And so what happens is that as they go through, you know, Joe's trying to find, um, he's trying to get to the gig that he's going to perform that night. That's Joe's big karmic attachment, right? I will be fulfilled when I play this gig with this famous sax player. So he's, he's in a cat's body, but he's suffering everything that Joe's body is suffering, even though he's not in the body. So it shows his attachment to the body causes him to suffer. But 22, on the other hand, she's in Joe's body. She is Joe for all intents and purposes. But because she doesn't have any labels for the world, um, she doesn't have any agendas, she doesn't have any identity as being Joe. As you know, Joe and the cat is experiencing all this stress and panic and all that stuff. She's just experiencing joy and beauty and the aliveness of the real world. 
the world as it is in the present moment, empty of labels or attachments. And 22 is basically like in having these nirvana moments while Joe Gardner in the cat's body is stressing out the whole time. And uh, I just thought that that was just a really amazing way to show karmic attachment and identification with the body and the way that it causes us to suffer. And then, you know, 22 kind of finds this urge to love something by first seeing someone else loving something. And they have that scene with 22 and the, uh, the trombone player girl, the little Asian girl who says she wants to quit. And, uh, you know, she just kind of asks her, why don't you like jazz? And she starts explaining and she starts playing the trombone for her. And the little girl is playing and she clearly loves playing the trombone. And 22 falls in love watching the little girl be in love. And that was just a really beautiful moment because she basically recognizes for the first time the experience of love or passion as being desirable. Because remember, 22 didn't want to be a human. She didn't want to incarnate. She didn't see any purpose or meaning in it. And so she, she's recognizing her true nature by seeing it first in someone else. And no other reason was good enough for her to want to incarnate. But in that moment, she starts to have her spark, right? She's starting to find her purpose for incarnating again. So there's little moments like when Joe the cat, uh, he's trying to prepare his body to play the gig and he's trying to give himself a shave and he shaves a patch of his hair off of his head and he freaks out seeing himself with this gap in his head and uh, 22 doesn't even care and thinks it's funny and she's like, oh, I'm fine, don't worry, I'm good because she's not identified as the body so she can't suffer from what happens to the body. Uh, 22 tears her pants uh, and she thinks it's funny and she's like, look, Joe, and her underwear is showing. And again, Joe's in a cat's body and he's freaking out as if he's in the other body with his underwear showing. So it's like no matter what happens to Joe's body, 22 cannot suffer from it because she's not identified. So she's just stuck as a Buddha. She's just laughing and joyful and having a fun time without any cares, without any worries. And then we get to the part where Terry, who's looking for Joe to take him back to the astral plane, <laughs> accidentally sucks the wrong guy out of his body. And this poor guy is like terrified because he's, he basically, he's having the shocking experience of I am not that body. And it shows him like, you know, in, in the back of the street alleyway, like in a total panic attack, which again shows why we suffer from identifying with the body. The poor guy's having like a little dark night of the soul in the, in the back of the alley. Um, but as the movie progresses, you know, Joe is continually oblivious to these beautiful moments that 22 keeps having because he's lost in his thoughts and he's not in the present moment. So 22 is, you know, enjoying the flavor of pizza and the beauty of a, a flower petal in the wind and a street musician in the subway. And she's just mesmerized over and over again. She's in heaven all the time as she's experiencing the pure naked beauty of, of reality without labels or attachments. It's just everything she experiences, she sees beauty in it. And actually, she becomes so mesmerized by the present moment that she finally has the realization that she wants to live as a human. And there's that, that kind of funny line where she says, I think I can find my purpose here. Like, I really enjoy walking. I think I could find my purpose in walking. And Joe's kind of like, oh, that's just a normal thing we do. Forget about it. You're not going to find your purpose in that. And again, it just kind of is pointing to this fact of joy is found in our original innocence. Like, the joy is found in the, even the simplest, most mundane things we overlook. In the present moment, you can experience beauty in all of it. You can find purpose in all of it. But you have to become like a little child first, right? Like Jesus said. So because she wasn't looking to fulfill herself in anything in particular, all of life actually fulfilled her in the deepest possible way. And she knew, I want to be a human. I want to keep experiencing this. So she runs away and Joe, you know, is trying to chase her down. 
And then I think Terry finds him and sucks him back into the, uh, into the astral plane, both of them together. And I thought it was cool how they show these, um, these kind of uh, quantum angel beings, the higher selves, even though they break the rules, like they never show any disapproval or judgment at all. There's, they're always in this very kind of blissful, happy state. And they're like, hey, back to, back to where we left off, you know? And uh, I think he says to Joe, Joe, Joe asks one of the Jerry's, like, well, I need to find my purpose, my meaning. And he says, oh, you guys with your meaning and your purpose for life, so basic. I love that part because it's sort of implying there's something beyond the concept of meaning and purpose. Like, we see meaning and purpose. What's my purpose in life? The purpose of life is living, right? Living life is life's purpose because each and every moment presents you with a different meaning, with a different purpose. So that's why being present is the most important aspect of connecting with who you are. You'll never find the meaning of the moment if you're not in the moment. And so the Jerry character is kind of insinuating that what we think is the highest, greatest thing for a human, that the purpose of a human lifetime actually is a limitation being placed on life. So it, it sort of sparks a question, what could be beyond purpose? And that's something that each and every one of us individually has to find out. So Joe goes back, he lives his perfect dream moment. He crushes it in the performance, the sax player. She's super happy with him. And then the moment's over and the next moment happens and you see Joe kind of feeling a little bit down. He's beginning to realize you can't find your purpose in any one particular thing in life. A purpose is not a static thing, right? If we see purpose as like a mission to be accomplished, a task to be accomplished, well, that's something that's time bound, right? So that, that moment's going to come and then it's going to go and it's going to be over. And then what? Where are you now? What's your purpose now? When we live that way, according to life, we suffer because the mind says, oh, and I'm lost now. What's my purpose now? And the, the ego will always seek to re-fulfill that purpose. So whether you think that purpose is in money, well, guess what? You'll never make enough money for the ego. Uh, you'll never have enough fame or success for the ego. You can't look for your purpose in any one particular thing. Being present with life and living life is the only purpose there is. So after Joe fulfills his big karmic attachment to his lifetime and he's left feeling empty, then and only then does he begin to experience the real world that 22 had been experiencing all along. So it shows him in that scene on the subway and he remembers 22 on the subway and how, you know, he sits down at the piano and starts playing and he, he puts all the items that 22 had collected, all these seemingly insignificant things, you know, the piece of a bagel she gave to the street performer, the taste of the pizza, the, the lollipop, the flower petal in the breeze. And as he's playing uh, on the piano, he gets into that flow state and he re-experiences all those seemingly insignificant things through her eyes. And he sees the beauty that she saw. And then he starts to look at his whole life through that lens, at all the moments of presence and stillness that he'd had, riding his bike to school, looking up at fireworks on the 4th of July, spending time with his dad, the taste of warm apple pie. And he realizes that the meaning of life is life itself. Meaning is all around you and you are making it with your perception of the world. You see the world as you are. You are the universe looking at itself. And it kind of zooms out uh, above the city, out to the stars, and then out to the whole galaxy. And it's like the, the recognition is the whole thing is you. You are the supreme being experiencing itself as this little finite entity. and. Truly, that is the meaning of life, and that's a meaning that is wordless. It must be experienced. No one can teach it to you. You can't read it in a book. You have to live life, be present with life, and contact the supreme beauty that is all around you that is yourself, that is your true nature. And Joe has that experience. Like, I just couldn't believe a Disney movie 
is showing an experience of cosmic consciousness, like a true spiritual awakening. And that was the <laughs> the scene in the movie where I I just I lost it, like my whole body like tightened up and I just started crying, like I couldn't handle the beauty of that scene. It was just amazing. And so then Joe has to save 22 from being a lost soul. And this was the next really amazing part to me. Um, Joe realizes that he had traumatized her into that position of becoming lost by sort of downplaying all the meaning she was seeing in the world. And Joe is saying, you know, you have no purpose. Those things that you love aren't meaningful, you idiot kind of stuff. And, you know, he has to undo his karmic attachment to her because he, he did things and said things to 22 that, that caused her to suffer. And that's what a karmic attachment to somebody else is, right? Uh, 22 had been traumatized by Joe and she became lost in her defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are those things that the mind builds to keep us safe from reliving traumas. And so it constantly reminds us of those traumas. And that's why it shows the souls like, like it showed 22. She was just repeating kind of ad nauseum all the statements that Joe said to her. And this is a really deep spiritual truth that I talk about on my channel in a few different videos. Um, the one that comes to mind is called defense mechanisms. And it's the idea that defense mechanisms actually, they offer you what they seek to defend you against. Like the defense mechanism is the trauma. A defense mechanism keeps you recreating and reliving that trauma in your mind. So she's repeating those phrases and it's like she's in a self-created nightmare that, uh, that Joe had kind of created for her, right? So how does he get her out of it? Forgiveness. He has to tell her he's sorry and he has to tell her how great she is. He has to give her love. And as soon as she smiles, that's when the defense mechanism dissolves. And I just went, wow, like this is so much deeper than most people realize because this is really how we heal. We have to love those defense mechanisms. We have to love that traumatized part of our psyche. And whenever we love something in our mind that has been traumatized, we're sending it the message of like, hey, it's safe. It's safe now. You can lay down these defenses. You don't need to protect me against this anymore. The only energy that can send that message to the subconscious mind is love. So this is what we call shadow work, right? This movie shows shadow work in such a profoundly accurate way. Again, I was just like doing a standing ovation <laughs> on my couch. So it goes on and Joe basically sacrifices his life for 22. Uh, once he has worked through his karmic attachment and he's unattached, he becomes selfless. And it, it reminded me of that, that Bible verse that says, greater love has no man than this that he laid down his life for his friend. It's pointing to this truth that being unattached and unidentified from any form, from any worldly thing, is the highest state of love. When you are attached to anything, to any person, you cannot love them. You cannot love and be attached at the same time. You have to be empty and free. And in that state, you're in the state of giving. If you want from somebody, if you need something from somebody, you cannot love them because love gives, it doesn't take. So you can't be in a state of taking and giving at the same time. And so the higher self gives him another chance to reincarnate if he wants to, which I thought was really cool because it shows how once he's unattached, he has true free will. Like free will comes from being unattached. When you have an attachment, you actually don't have free will because you are enslaved to that attachment. You have to go relive that karma until you transcend it. So it even spoke to the idea of free will, which is the idea that like we human beings kind of feel and sense like we have free will, but of course we don't because we suffer. Suffering is the indicator that you have lost your free will by being attached to the world. You need certain outcomes to happen. You need people and things to work out the way you want. And if they don't, you suffer. Anger, fear, depression, whatever. Only by being free of those things do you actually embody true free will. 
And it, the movie shows that when the higher self gives Joe another chance to reincarnate if he wants to, or he can go to the great beyond. And uh, Joe essentially chooses to be a bodhisattva. And a bodhisattva in the Buddhist tradition is basically a soul that has transcended all karmic attachment to the world, but still chooses to go back into the world to sort of bless the world with their enlightenment. And, you know, Joe has this new motivation to go back into the world and really live for the first time, to really experience the joy and the beauty of life in the present moment. And it reminds me of that verse where Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. There will be suffering, but take heart for I have overcome the world. And in that verse, it's sort of like, what do you mean, Jesus? Like you've never even probably been out of Israel. How could you, how could you say you've overcome the world? Christ was pointing to this idea of, I have, I have transcended all attachment to the material world. So it's like, look to me for truth because I can show you the way. Get rid of those nasty contaminations, those attachments to needing things for happiness. This movie shows that in such a beautiful way. It's like, you need nothing to be happy, but you need something to be sad. You need a reason to be sad. There needs to be a story to be sad. And this movie has a way of showing you like, get rid of all those reasons, you know, get rid of the, the, the false meaning you're attaching to the world and just live life or better yet, let life live you. And that's really the, the underlying uh, meaning of the movie to me was like, there is no individual self that is living life of its own individual control and willpower, but we are all life itself. We are all that original source consciousness, that original innocence that is being lived by the one infinite creator. And um, in that light, the world shines with a whole new purpose and meaning that you never could have imagined. That is the kingdom of heaven. So go live it, go enjoy it. Thanks for watching.